I'll ask that you look in your Bibles at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 as we consider verses 1 and 2. As you're looking, let me thank your pastor for his kind words. You know, there are friends for a time, and then there are friends through the years. And uh, I very much respect your pastor as the latter, as a friend for the years. Uh, He won't tell you, but uh, on rare occasions in the Presbyterian Church in America, there have been controversies. And I was in one some years ago, and it is good when you have friends for the years who have your back. And uh, your pastor was one of those who uh, set up the place and the conversation and the defense, and I consider him a lifetime advocate, for which I am very grateful. So uh, my thanks uh, to him and my privilege uh, to be in his church this day. Are you at Romans 12? Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. But the word of God stands forever. So it, has been almost, so it has been almost exactly one month since the death of Amun al-Zawahiri, the mastermind of 9-11. And if that doesn't mean much to you, if that has gone beyond your notice, it is, of course, because we are tired of news from that part of the world. The names and nations all blend, all run together in our minds. Saddam Hussein, Osama bin Laden, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Afghanistan. We're just tired of it. If our nation decides something militarily or politically, we have one resolve as a nation. Nobody really debates it. No more forever wars. And if there's any mention of the Middle East, our minds naturally run a course of asking the question, can anything good come out of the Middle East? To answer that question, Christian news commentator Jim Dennison writes these words. In recent years, so many Muslims have been coming to Christ that ministries are placing ads in newspapers throughout the Middle East asking this question. Have you seen the man in white robes In your dreams. The question is reflecting the experience of tens of thousands of people across the Middle East who are having exactly the same dream. A man in white robes appears to those who have been taught to hate Jesus. And beckons them to come to Jesus and to know his mercy. Now, I must tell you something. I am a Reformed Presbyterian. And I don't quite know what to make of this. Whether I'm supposed to affirm it or deny it, I mean, it doesn't fit my categories. 
What it makes plain to me and is undeniable is that it represents an amazing mercy of God. Out of our darkness and our pain and our shame, Jesus comes and mercy flows. We want to know who to blame or we hang our heads in shame at the loss of billions of dollars and the more costly expense of American lives to bring democracy to the Arab Spring and now an abject failure recognized none of that happened as we hope and yet out of our darkness and pain and shame Jesus comes and mercy flows. We must not fail to recognize what the secular media does not or perhaps cannot see and say. Listen to me. In the last 15 years, more Muslims have come to faith in Jesus Christ than in the last 15 centuries. The fastest growing church in the world is in Iran, persecuted, underground, flourishing. We are currently training pastors in Iraq, the nation with more house churches flourishing than any other nation, wait for it, is, some of you are saying it, Afghanistan. People hiding, people persecuted, people in danger of their life, worshiping Jesus Christ. Out of darkness and pain and shame, Jesus comes and mercy flows. It is the old, old story. Listen, in 1948, when the communists drove the missionaries out of China, everybody would have reasoned, the gospel is done. It had just begun. Do you know that on this Sunday, this very day, there will be more people worshiping Jesus Christ in China than in the United States? A smaller proportion of the population, but such a large population that there will be more people worshiping Jesus Christ in China this Sunday than in the United States. Out of darkness and pain and shame, Jesus comes and mercy flows. It's always been that way. When the Romans crucified Jesus, when the Jewish authorities tried to crush the church that had followers of him nonetheless, what happened instead of crushing the church, of destroying faith, was that believers became like seeds on the wind throughout the ancient world. And within two centuries, Christianity would be the faith of Rome. And in our lifetimes, the majority faith of the entire world. Islam is not larger. Christianity, the largest faith of the world in our lifetimes and still growing rapidly in portions of the world. And and we hang our heads and think of our failures and do not lift our heads and say, what is God doing and how is he doing it? Recognize where we are in this book of Romans. You're right at that middle pivot point in the book of Romans where the apostle has just spent 11 chapters describing the darkness and the pain and the shame. Going all the way back to Adam and Eve, our first parents, that out of their sin, corruption, darkness, pain, shame, entered this world, ultimately touching everyone. So the apostle would say, there is none righteous. No, not one. And he counts himself, looking at himself and saying, that which I would do, that I do not do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And his answer is, thanks be to God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is therefore now, no what? Condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, things present, things to come, height or depth or anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise God for the mercy that is our power. It is, after all, what the apostle is doing. It's reminding us of all that great gospel truth to say what? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, in light of this mercy, so amazing, so astounding, so enduring, so resolute, that you would offer your bodies as living sacrifices to God. It's just, it's just the simple that we don't look at the mercy of God and we set it up on a shelf and we say, isn't, isn't that marvelous? It, it's, it's actually to be motivation and power in the Christian life. So it is a church comes out of covid the darkness of not just our dealing with the disease, but with each other. As we become a world more entrenched in wars that don't seem to stop happening, as we face economic uncertainty, we say, what are we supposed to do here now? The word to the church is always, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God. We're, We're to be making mercy our our motivation. And it's obvious in these opening words. Verse 1, I appeal to you, referring to all that's just been said, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, you may not hear the power of those words until you consider what could have gone in their place. I appeal to you, brother. By the guilt that you will feel if you don't. I appeal to you, brothers, by the rejection that you will face if you fail. None of that. I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to Him. It's the beauty of the mercy of God being presented as the motivation for the Christian life. After all, where we will go from this this piece of the book of Romans is to all the obligations, civil and moral, corporate and individual. But before we're told about any of those aspects of being living sacrifices, we are being told what's to drive us, what's to motivate us, what's the fuel in your tank. The mercies of God. Now, you may not be able to hear that if if you were raised with some aspects of our kind of common evangelical tradition that I was raised with. When I was a child, I was a member, maybe like some of you, some of you are my vintage, of I was a member of the BMA, the Bible Memory Association. Lots of kids of my age were members of the BMA. And evangelical churches of lots of different denominations had children, and you would receive a, an illustrated book. It was beautiful every month, and it had verses in it for you to memorize. And if you memorized enough verses, you got a prize. I can remember with pride getting my glow-in-the-dark cross of Jesus. I'm not defending the theology of this, by the way. I'm just saying that's what we did. Because if you memorize verses, and the reason that you're memorizing them is for your performance to get a prize, that can do something to you. After all, I can still rattle off these verses in the King James Version, because that's how we memorized it back then, and I can do it just like that. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. I can't do that in the NIV or the ESV. I have to do it in the King James. Um, but in the King James, I can, I can get it pretty good. And, and what I said to you is correct. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. I mean, we did a lot of beseeching in the King James days, you know. But even though I can say it correctly, It's not what my heart heard. 
I rattled it off correctly to you, but this is what my heart heard. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, and then you'll be holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Is that what it says? It is not. But is it not what we tend to hear in our childlike hearts? You be a good living sacrifice, and then you'll be holy and acceptable to God. Oh, friends, you must hear me. Holy and acceptable are not a description of what you will become. They are a declaration of what you are. You are holy and acceptable to God. And we begin to want to debate with the apostle. How could I possibly be holy and acceptable to God? I know my failures of the past week. I may know my failures of the past night or even on my drive to church. How could I possibly be holy and acceptable to God? Well, where did the verse begin? In view of God's mercies which were not distributed because of your deserving, which are not yours because of your earning, the word holy should have been a clue. Is what you do going to make you holy to God? After all, your best works are just what? Filthy rags. If you want to scare Christians, read Jesus' words in Luke 17, 10. When you have done all that you should do, you are still an unworthy servant. Wait, 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 Lord, I did all I should do. Yes, but what you do is what, not what gives you a place at the king's table. But faith in what Christ has done. Not your merit, but his mercy. And when that mercy begins to fill your heart, when you begin to, to take joy, not in your performance or the conditionality of the Lord's love, but you rejoice that he declares you holy and acceptable by his mercy, not by your merit, it begins to change you. It, it, that motivation takes over in your life. It, it changes the way you relate to your spouse, to your kids, to your grandkids. How do I know? I look back just a few months in my own life, and uh, it may be hard to remember, but do you remember last winter when an ice storm came across the Mid-South? My oldest son lives in Memphis, and all their power was lost. And after about the third day of no power and the temperature in the house going into the low 40s, we got a call from my son. Can we come to live with you? You still got power. <laughs> sure, come on. And so, of course, my son, his wife, their daughter, their son, and the dog <laughs> come to live with us. And you know, I, I so admire the patient tenderness of my wife because you know, while my, my patience and my tenderness are kind of running toward empty, now dads, you know how this works, I look at the antics and the difficulties of our grandchildren and I will look at my son and I'll say, Serves you right, bud. <laughs> but my wife and her tender heart becomes vulnerable because she sees in the errors of our grandchildren the errors of us in raising our children. And as I'm admiring her tenderness, I recognize it makes her heart hurt. Because she will think back to mistakes made decades ago. A word misspoken, an anger too intense, a birthday forgot. And she'll just begin to spiral down into hurt and despair. And the consequence is, knowing herself, she says she's learned never to go into that file of painful memories without first opening the file drawer with the key that is called mercy. I have to remember too. And I imagine you do also. And so the apostle says, I appeal.
appeal to you. Before we do any obligation, before we talk about any of these other, I appeal to you by the mercies of God to offer your bodies as living sacrifices to him because you're holy and you're acceptable to him as hard as that may be for you to understand. And that's not just a message for the moms of little kids. I mean, that's, that's the message for men and women and leaders in the church and ministers of the gospel. Jim and I will know, you know the, the account of the amazing minister, Scottish minister of the last century, Alexander White. A disaster had come to his town, and so the ministers gathered in his home. What are we going to do? And after that meeting was over, all the men went back to their homes, but, but one older man lingered until it became embarrassing. You know, you've had these guests. When's he going to leave? Finally, it became uncomfortable, and the older man, noting it, spoke in words of seeming jest. Now, Dr. White, what word of comfort do you have for an old sinner like me? And though it was said in jest, Alexander White later wrote, it took my breath away. He was an old saint but he had lost the comfort of the gospel. Alexander White said he didn't quite know what to do, and so to this man who had just said, what word of comfort do you have for an old sinner like me? Dr. White just got up out of his chair and he crossed the room, he took the hand of the older man, and he quoted the words of the Old Testament prophet Micah. What word of comfort for an old sinner like me? He delights in mercy. What kind of God are you that delights in showing mercy, says the apostle and the prophet. Not much more was said. Older man went home. But the next day, a note came to Dr. White's house. Dear Dr. White, those words that you spoke to me were strength to my soul. I had lost hope. But you reminded me of the heart of my Lord. I will never doubt him again. And the next time Satan throws my sin in my face, I will say to him, yes, it's all true. And you know not the half of it. But I have to deal with the one who delights in mercy. And so do I. And so do you. Out of darkness and pain and shame, Jesus comes and mercy flows and he delights to show such mercy. It's not just our motivation. It is ultimately the power of the Christian life. You know these words. After being told to offer our bodies as living sacrifices in view of this mercy, what what are we told will happen? Be not conformed to this world. Verse 2, but be transformed by what? The renewal of your mind, that you may test and approve what God's pleasing, perfect will is. And and, and I must tell you, a lot of us know those verses well because you can't be in our ranks very long until people quote this verse at you as, as the... Not being conformed to the world is being transformed by having a Christian worldview or reading good books or listening to Jim's sermons. You know, you just, just fill up your mind with good stuff and, and that's going to change you. Now listen, there are verses in the Bible about filling up your mind with good stuff. This is not one of them. What is this verse about? You have to remember the Apostle Paul is beginning this argument about the power of mercy two chapters earlier in Romans chapter 10. And he opens Romans chapter 10 grieving for his Jewish brothers and sisters. He writes this about them, Romans 10 2. I I bear them witness. They have a zeal for God, but not according to to knowledge. Do you hear that? There is something wrong with their minds. What's wrong with their minds? Verse 3, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, 
They did not submit to God's righteousness. What happens if you're not motivated by mercy? If, if you've got to be right with God by your righteousness, it's not his declaration that you are holy and acceptable, but it's your performance that makes you acceptable. You know you can't be holy. So the average person says what? Well, I know I'm not perfect. I'm just better than those people over there. <laughs> and, and so now what drives the Christian life is comparison and competition. And as a result, you cannot do the will of God. By seeking to establish your own righteousness, the only ultimate standard you have is the standard of pride. I'm doing better than other folks. I'm doing better than I was. Rather than the standard of humility, which is only the holiness of God is my standard, and I only achieve it by the mercy of God. No claim on what I've accomplished. No claim on what I could do, but only what he has done. And when that begins to humble you, then mercy becomes the filter by which we are examining every act and action of the Christian life. Is, is this in accord with the mercy of God? Or is it some aspect of comparison or competition? Have I got to beat those people or win this argument or win this debate or do better than they? Or am I simply offering my body as a living what? Sacrifice. Totally submissive to the will of God out of gratitude for his mercy to me, not for any other reason. Because I will tell you, if it's not mercy that motivates you, then the unreasonable things that God is calling us to do will be unable to be accomplished by you. After all, that was the King James Version, do you remember? This is your reasonable Service. You want to know how unreasonable what we're in call to do is? You just keep going down Romans chapter 12. You look at verse 10. These are the obligations that come for those who are living sacrifices motivated by the mercy of God. Verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. But God, they don't deserve honor. I know, says the Lord, but I delight in mercy. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. But Lord, they started it. I know, but I delight in mercy. Never avenge yourselves, verse 19. Never avenge yourselves? But Lord, you know what he did to me? You know what they did to my family? You know how they hurt our church? I know, says the Lord. But I delight in mercy. Chapter 14, verse 13, let's not pass judgment on one another any longer. But Lord, they are wrong. Maybe. <laughs> but I delight in mercy. The apex of it all, chapter 15 and verse 1, we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. But Lord, what if all this struggle means I'm the weak one? Then remember that I delight in mercy. Mercy is not just motivation. It is ultimately the power of the Christian life. When how we have been received begins to govern how we receive and forgive and live for Christ's sake, that others would know the mercy. Does it really change things? I think it, in terms of friend of ours, Paul Koistra, long-term mission leader, early in his ministry, says he ministered in a disadvantaged school district of the rural south. 
The kids in that program struggled to read, struggled to advance in school. If ever you didn't read on grade level, you got put in a remedial reading program, get you back up on grade level. Here was the problem. If ever you got identified as a problem reader, that became a label that kept you in the remedial reading program. No one who went in got out. It was like this academic whirlpool, except for one young woman. Her name was Edie. Because she was good at track, they called her Speedy Edie. (laughs) Speedy Edie got out. And, of course, now everyone begins to focus to the teacher. What would you do different with Edie? Did did you give her different books? Well, 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 no. Uh, Different curriculum? Uh, Different methods? Well, Well, no. Well, you must have done something different with Edie. Said the teacher, well, you know, Edie's good at track. Yeah, we know all about speedy eating, said the teacher. I used to go to her track meets, and I cheered for her. And that was the difference. There is someone for you. Do you recognize how much better the gospel is? You are holy and acceptable to God, not by any merit in you, but by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ for you. His mercy is so vast, so amazing, that it not only is greater than all your sin, it is sufficient for the evil and the wrong of the world around us. All who would come to him in faith would know that mercy as well. How strong is it? Well, just just imagine, if you can just imagine You know, we've just started down the football road again. Imagine the Titans are in the Super Bowl. This may take a little imagination, but imagine. (laughs) And it's the winning touchdown in the last seconds of the fourth quarter. Imagine the stadium erupting with hooray and applause. And I will tell you, those cheers are dim compared to 10,000 times 10,000 angels declaring to God over you, holy and acceptable is this one to God. That is heaven's declaration of you. That is the cheer of heaven. That is the applause of the saints. That is the victory cry of the angels over you. Holy and acceptable are you to God. I appeal to you, brothers, By the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. This is not just your reasonable worship. This is your spiritual worship as those claimed by the blood of Christ to live for the glory of the Lamb. May God so enable you by His mercy. Amen. God, so... Teach us, we pray, with the refrain of grace that makes our service sweet and our service strong. By mercy, by mercy, by mercy. May it fill up our tanks for the service of the Savior, we pray this day. In Jesus' name, amen.